Um, so on the 7th of August, we have the Featherston Hawes. Um, Mark and Liz are a couple from Willowfield who have left these wet and windy shores to go over to Cambodia to set up a charity called Eggshell that works with some very vulnerable children in very difficult circumstances. Um, so they've been away for quite a while and they're back now for a little um, summer break. And on the 7th of August, they're coming here. It's a Sunday night and at seven o'clock, they'll be telling us some things that they've been getting up to and how we can basically pray for them and continue to support them. So please definitely be there. Um, the day after, on the 8th of August, is our next focus prayer night. Um, it's just so important for us as a church to just be praying, not just as individuals, I'm sure you all pray every day yourselves, but how great is it when we all come together as just one big body of Christ to lift up the prayers and, and just really spend time with God. So that's on the 8th of August. Bishop Bible Week um, is the 30th of August to the 3rd of September. All of the details are there and it's in Willowfield this year, guys, so we don't even need to travel. So definitely book it in and definitely come down. Alpha um, is starting again on the 20th of September. Alpha is a brilliant course. I've done it many times as a person and as a leader, and it's just a fantastic way to get people into church and to get to know God a little bit better. People only come if you invite them, so um, that burden is kind of on you, so <laughs> please think of someone and pray about people that you can invite to join our Alpha on the 20th of September, and speak to John if you have any more questions. And finally, my favorite kind of announcement is about food. So all, <laughs> in September, we are hitting our 150th birthday. Happy birthday, Willowfield, you're looking great. Um, for 150, definitely. And on the 17th of September, we're gonna be having a church dinner where we can all gather together and have some food and just celebrate how 150 years this little church has grown into what it is today. So um, stick that in your diaries. Who doesn't love grub? I definitely do. Um, so please do keep an eye on this. Um, there's lots of other things um, on it that I've skipped. But for now, I'd love to invite Mark up and I'd love to pray for him before he brings us God's word. Um, God, we just, we thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word. As we open the Bible today, we pray that we would hear your voice. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be at work, opening our ears to hear and our eyes to, and our hearts to receive your word. Father, we ask you to bless Mark as he speaks to us this evening for the final time. Lord, we pray for this man of God. Please come and be his shepherd now. Protect him, guard his mind, and minister to his heart. Father, be his anchor. Come and fill his vision. So, Lord, we just ask you to fill him with your spirit as he brings us this message from your most precious word. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Charlene. Good evening, everyone. How are we? Um, I, I would love, so the, the passage that I've been given, I've been given two, but I'm going to give you three, okay, just because why not? So we'll be in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 is where we will be. We will also be in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm going to throw in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 as well. So 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 4, and chapter 11. Chapter 1, chapter 4, and chapter 11. Of that. And before we read those, I want to just give us some context as to who writes this book, because I think that's really, really interesting. The person that writes this, or the author of the chapters that we will read in a moment, is someone called Paul, previously known as Saul, who infamously was one of the fiercest persecutors of the Christian church. As Saul, he was hell-bent on shutting the church down went to extreme lengths to either imprison or murder anyone connected with the church or anything to do with the church. He was hell-bent on stamping it out, stopping it, shutting it down. We shouldn't have been meeting here tonight if it were for Paul or Saul. We wanted to shut it down and stop it. Very violent, very brutal man. But you will remember that famously and dramatically Saul had an encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. He was literally stopped in his tracks and met Jesus. And from that point on, 
He was no longer called Saul, he was called Paul, and there's this radical transformation in his life as he goes on to be an apostle, an ambassador for Christ, and is responsible for spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. Your New Testament, if you have it, or if you know this, is made up of 27 books. 13 of those books Paul wrote, four of which he writes from prison. He's also famous for having three huge missionary journeys where he covered tens of thousands of miles over a decade of his life. He planted churches. He established Christian communities of believers. He traveled unknown seas. He traveled over dangerous and unfamiliar terrain without Google Maps or without four by four Jeeps. He accomplished one of the most successful missionary journeys ever. What a transformation. What a transformation. I wonder if you could go back in time, and if you could, would you want to go on a mission trip with Paul? If you could, would that be something that would interest you? Because could you imagine the stories you would tell? Could you imagine the people that you would meet and the places that you would go? Could you imagine how transformational this mission journey might have been? He goes on three. Imagine you just got to go on one. Imagine you just got to go on one leg of one of his missionary journeys. It would have been phenomenal and amazing. So hands up if you could travel back in time and you could go on a mission trip with Paul, who would go? Oh, I'm so with you. I am so with you. I've got my passport ready. I've got the flights booked. I am ready to go. That is until we read some of the stuff we're going to read tonight. That is until we read about dangers and threats and hardship. Because did I forget to mention that little detail? Mm hmm. Because it's there. It's there. Like just look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. So remember, you've already signed up. If you put your hand up, you've signed up and you're going. It's too late to pull out, okay? And we're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. We do not want you to be informed, uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. Pause. The, the what you experienced in the province of Asia, the troubles. The, the troubles that are mentioned here are a mystery. Lots of debates. Theologians love to guess and debate what's going on. Some of them say it has something to do with riots. It has something to do with a lynch mob. It has something to do with violence that was directed at Paul as he was preaching the gospel in Ephesus. That's what some think. Others think, well, he maybe had to res wrestle with some wild animals in part of that journey as well. But whatever the difficulties... Whatever it was, Paul continues in verse 8. We were under great pressure. This is just the first verse. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Verse 9 of chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. Hands up if you still want to go on a trip with Paul. Maybe that was just a one-off. Maybe that was just a one-off. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's see what it says. I have worked, this is Paul speaking, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I have received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labeled, labeled and toiled and have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst, and I have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked besides everything else. I face daily the pressures of my concern for all the churches. I'm sure Paul's a lovely fella, and God bless him on his mission trips and tours. 
but I think I'm going to pass. Like, I think that would have been a hugely transformational experience, and I'll probably miss out, but did you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11? I, I'm out. I'm sorry, I am out. I want my money back. I'm not keen anymore. Cancel my flights. I'll fake COVID if I have to, but I am not going on a trip with Paul because you would have to be out of your mind to go after this kind of stuff. You would have to be out of your mind to walk intentionally towards dangers and threats and hardship or even to want dangers and hardships and threats to go hand in hand with your friendship with God. I don't want that. I I don't want that. Make your judgments about me as you will. I don't want that. I I want nice, easy, comfortable Christian living. I want it safe. I want it nice. I want it easy. And maybe if you were honest with yourself tonight, you would say the same thing. What could possibly be the point in this, in these types of trips or in these types of experience? Well, you'd have to go back to Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll pick up from chapter 9, from verse 9. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 and 11, we'll read. But this happened. What happened? All the hardship, all the threats, all the danger, all that happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. Here's Paul's confidence. Worst case scenario, I'm going to die. But I have a God who resurrects dead people. That is his confidence that he has here. Or 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7. These are really famous verses. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. For we who are alive are being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you, verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweigh them all. Verse 18. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Verse 18, so we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Jars of clay. Jars of clay, that is what we are, jars of clay. One commentator called Hughes says this, clay jars were the throwaway containers of the ancient world so that their lifespan were generally a few years at the most. They were used to store and transport water or olive oil and wine and grain and even family treasures. Earthenware jars, get this, were the anonymous part of everyday living as they were used for cooking and eating and drinking and storing leftovers. No one took note of clay jars any more than they would take note of fast food containers today. They were simply there for convenience. It was no great tragedy when such vessels were broken. They were cheap and easy to replace. As such, jars of clay provide Paul with a penetrating metaphor for his and his followers' humanity. As clay jars, we are all frail and weak. But for seven, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The reason for this is so that we don't mistake where the power comes from. 
The reason for this, the reason we are clay jars is so that we don't mistake where the power comes from. Someone once asked St. Francis how he was able to accomplish so much. And he replied, this may be why. The Lord looked down from heaven and said, where can I find the weakest, littlest man on earth? Then he saw me and said, I found him. And he won't be proud of it. He'll see that I am only using him because of his insignificance. And that is the point. That is the point. Our insignificance is the point. It seems to me that we are transfixed sometimes on our own significance. We are addicted to our own importance and fame and success and opinions and brands and labels and achievements. And the danger comes when we start to believe the hype in ourselves or when we forget that we are clay jars or when we forget that the actual power is from within and it is not of us, it is of God. It's only whenever we set down pride And whenever we get rid of that fascination with always being at the center of the story, when we let go of success and reputation and fame and making a name for ourselves and where we are content for God's name and God's fame and God's renown to be at the center, when we are content to allow God to take the glory rather than we take the glory, when we are content to be ordinary, unremarkable, insignificant jars of clay, then and only then can God do extraordinary, remarkable, and significant things with our availability or with our obedience or with our yes to God. We're back in a summer series in the evening called Hungry Heart. And we're supposed to hunger after God or after Jesus or after the Holy Spirit. And if we just would do that, then we would be content. But you know and I know that there are other things that are fine for our attention. Other things and advertisements and stuff that are promising to fill that gap, to give us contentment, to give us happiness, to give us significance, to give us worth. And and sometimes in life, it is the things that happen in our life, like hardship, that will say, you can't have contentment. God can't be good if you are experiencing hardship. And that's why we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 4 and chapter 11, because it is warning us about the danger of losing contentment when hardship comes. Paul didn't have it easy. Like for Paul, hardship and threat and danger went hand in hand with his relationship or his friendship with God. But he refused to allow hardship to crush his contentment or his confidence in God. There's another book in the Bible called Philippians, and guess who writes Philippians? Paul, same person that we're looking at here tonight. And in chapter 4 of Philippians, he says this, chapter 4, verse 12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether they're living in plenty or in want. So here's the question. What's the secret? Give me the secret. What's the secret sauce, Paul, you're talking about here? Tell me. Give me the ingredients. Let me know what it is. Well, the secret of being content in every and every situation is there in chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. As one commentator says, the contextual meaning of all refers to the previous claim to be content whatever the circumstances. In all the situations of his life, in poverty or in prosperity, when well-fed or when hungry, Paul can be content. He is the power to endure all these extreme situations, all these ups and downs without anxiety, with the peace of God guarding his heart and his mind in Christ Jesus. And that's not trying to minimize your hardship. 
It's not trying to say it's not real or it doesn't matter. It does. It's real. It does matter. It hurts. It really hurts. It threatens your faith. It does threaten your contentment. It does threaten your confidence in God sometimes. It's not trying to minimize it. It's not trying just to slap a little verse on it or a little thought on it. But it is trying to say that we can give our hardships and those threats and those dangers over to God and we can trust God with our lives and we can trust God to rescue us in whatever that circumstance is that we find ourselves. During the week I was reading Psalm 90. It says this, I, God, will be with you in trouble. I, God, will be with you in trouble. And Nicky Gumbel comment, commented on it and said this, it is clear from this that those who love the Lord will not avoid trouble. God does not promise a trouble-free life. Rather, he promises that he will rescue you and protect you even in the darkest times. He is with you. You are never alone. I can do all things. I can face all things. I can endure all things. I can walk through all things. I can walk into all things because of who is always with me and who always strengthens me and who always rescues me. That's easy to preach. That's harder to walk out tonight or tomorrow or at some point down your life whenever tragedy hits. And I need to continually be asking God to guard my heart and my mind. I need to be continually asking God to reveal to me blind spots. I need to be continually meditating on God's Word and these promises. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. That could be your prayer. Just those words. You could sob them out. You could angrily yell them out. You could whisper them out. You could just read them over and over and over and over and over again. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. That's just one promise. Here's another. Psalm 27, 13 and 14. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Or Psalm 46. God is our refuge. I'm going to take time to read this all because it's so, so powerful. I've been meditating on this for months. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come and see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shield with fire. Be still. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored in every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. 
when there is destruction and when there is disorder all around us, when everything becomes disorientating, when all we can see is the troubles, when the fibers and the fabrics and the core of our world begin to shake and crumble and roar, when wars ravage, when the enemy boasts, when all seems lost, when what was once safe crumbles and dissolves around us, there is a voice that comes from heaven and simply and quietly and calmly yet powerfully says, be still and know that I am God. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Don't let hardship crush your contentment or confidence in God. Don't let hardship crush your contentment or your confidence in God. I wish there wasn't hardship I wish there wasn't pain. I wish life was so much easier. But as in those moments, those dark moments, that I've seen God work in the most beautiful of ways. It is in those despairing, heart-wrenching moments that I have sensed God closest. It is in those wilderness moments that I've experienced the intimacy of God like no other. And all of that, because I don't want to focus on me, all of that, I just say that because it brings me back to the cross. It brings me right back to the cross. Because at the cross, we see the darkest moment in history as Jesus dies. And in that horrific, horrible, cruel, heart-wrenching moment, we see the deepest love. We see darkness being swallowed up, not by more death, not by more pain, not by more trauma, not by more tragedy, but we see love and we see light and we see life bursting forth from the most unlikely of places. And from the most impossible of situations. And in that moment we get to stare away, away, away into the future. Where we see one day that Jesus will make all things new. That all hardship will stop and will end. And all pain will stop. We get to see a day where hardship and danger and pain and threats and discontent and suffering will happen for the last time. For the last time, all injustice will stop. All corruption will end. All trauma, all hurt, all evil, all war, all violence, all murder, every single thing that is wrong with this world, every single thing that is broken in this world will stop. And face to face we will see Jesus because the best is yet to come. So there's hope off of the future, but there is still a hope for today. Still hope for today, even in your hardship, even in your pain, even in your hurt, there is hardship. It's why Paul can say stuff like 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. God has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. It's why Paul can say stuff again like 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not 
crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Therefore, do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. As we end, one commentator says this. We're squeezed, but we're not squashed. We're bewildered, but we're not befuddled. We're pursued, but we're not abandoned. We're knocked down, but we're not knocked out. Where do you look? Where do you look? Well, as we end, and as I preach my last sermon, it is fitting, so incredibly fitting, that we look at that 2 Corinthians 4.18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So we fix your eyes, fix your eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Will you pray with me? God in heaven, we ask that that we would fix our eyes on you and you alone. Will you forgive us for fixing our eyes on temporal things? We're so good at that. So good at that. But forgive us, forgive us. Forgive us not only for looking at temporal things, but putting our trust or our hope or our confidence in temporal things. Please forgive us. If anything tonight, will you allow us to see the folly of that? Everything fades. Everything comes to an end. Everything stops. Everything has its time or its season or its 15 minutes of fame. Everything comes to an end. But only you, only you, Jesus, beautiful Jesus, only you are eternal. So we look to you. We look to you if our day is amazing, if our week is amazing, if our life is amazing, we look to you. We look to you and we look to you alone. We look to you if we have loads to eat and we have loads in our bank account and we have loads of stuff. We look to you and we hope in you. We look to you if we're hungry. We look to you if we have nothing. We look to you if we're broke. We look to you if we're weak. We look to you if we are at the end of ourselves. We look to you. So God, come. Holy Spirit, come. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh. Breathe in this place. Breathe new hope. Breathe new hope. Breathe new hope in the name of Jesus. We fix our eyes on you. Our confidence is in you. Because you are the God who saves. You are the God who rescues. You are the God who delivers. You are the God who turns up. You're the God who is beside us. You're the God who is with us. You're the God who will not abandon us. You're the God that will not disappoint us. You're the God that will not walk away. You are here. You are close. You are powerful. So allow us to be still and look to you and worship you. We pray these things in your name for your glory, for your fame, for your renown. And everyone said, amen, amen. I'd love to invite you to stand and worship God.